Hey Tommy, it's been another busy week for us. Uh, we have actually been on the road. Where did you go? Well, I was in Detroit, Michigan, checking out the brand new 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee L. And I was in California, in Santa Barbara, checking out the brand new Mercedes-Benz S-Class. You know, the big flagship, right? The big... Uh, and then, uh, you know what, maybe we'll sneak in another um, vehicle that you went to, which really belongs on the truck podcast, but what's that one? Well, I got a chance to see the new Ford Maverick, the tiny little truck from Ford. Yeah. Um, and I saw that in person and got to crawl around it a little bit, so we'll talk about that at the very end. Yeah, so let's uh, hit all three of those. Is there any news you want to hit, first and foremost? Ooh, is there any big news? It, um, it's been kind of slow, actually. There's a new Tesla coming tomorrow. Yes, but that's probably... Already yesterday, when by the time we listened to this podcast. Okay. <laughs> so the news there is that Jay Leno apparently uh, took a Tesla Model S Plaid, the new version of the S, uh, and did a drag pass at, I think, 9.2 something seconds. Uh, before then, the fastest production car was a Bugatti and, of course, the Demon. Uh, but uh, now it's going to be the new Tesla Model S Plaid. Whether it's official or not, I don't know. There's, there's always like, you know, there's always like people are like, did you use drag tires? Is it actually the production version of it? You know, you know, um, it's always a little bit shrouded in controversy. So there's one more piece of news we forgot. What's that? Which was pretty big. It may not affect a lot of our U.S. viewers. Yeah. But abroad, Toyota revealed the new Land Cruiser, so the 300 series Land Cruiser. A Land Cruiser only happens like once every 10 or 12 years. So this is a, a pretty big deal for the off-road community. But unfortunately, it's not coming to the States, although it might tell us some hints about the upcoming Tundra. Yeah, and I think Andre's going to be talking about that over at TFL uh, uh, Talking Trucks, right? Because that's really a truck in our view. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. But I just thought we should put that out there that there's a new Land Cruiser. Yeah, and if you guys, by the way, if you guys uh, want to support this podcast, as you know, we don't have any advertising in here. Uh, and that is mainly due to our friends at Patreon, all of our patrons who come and who uh, donate, whether it's $2 or $10. We would love to have you. Uh, we're trying to keep uh, this as... Uh, well, commercial-free as possible. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, and uh, I get really tired of now, you know, having to like wade through, you know, ten minutes of commercial for a forty-minute podcast. Mm. And it's stuff I don't care about, to be honest. It's like not very well. Like soaps and hats and oh. shoes and. No, no, not not even that. It's... Mustache products and. No, not, I don't have a mustache. Not mustache products, like podcast platforms or me undies or. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff that, that is not, you know, or noon, right? Uh, What's which I probably noon? should care about. It's a weight loss thing. Oh. Yeah, so there noon. you go. Noon, me undies. You got some free plugs there on, on TFL's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with uh, the Grand Cherokee L. What, what does the L mean? Right, so this is pretty cool. It's been something like 12 years since there's been a brand new Grand Cherokee. And they're still selling. Yeah, so the current one is selling like hotcakes. Yeah. I don't know exactly off the top of my head how many, but it's got to be in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, it competes with cars like the Explorer, right? It's a classic American big old SUV. But here's the thing. Did well, you know there has size. there has never been a six- or seven-seater version of the Grand Cherokee? So the Grand Cherokee came out in, what, 1993? Yeah. And since then, um, there have been now five generations. But up until this fifth gen, there's never been a three-row. And I was talking to the Jeep folks, and they said they've been losing sales to vehicles like the Explorer, like the Pilot, like the Highlander, um, because those are offered in seven seats, but well, not well, the Grand Cherokee until now. Or more like the Telluride and Palisade, because those yeah. guys are also like selling like hotcakes. Although the chief designer, Mark Allen, yeah. um, has actually been with the Grand Cherokee program since the very first one, and he said that they, they have done a concept version, or at least a prototype version, of a seven-seater for every single generation, but it's never been greenlit. Yeah, and it's weird that I think now all of a sudden there's, you know, there's, there's like, oh, gosh, there's styles and everything, including automotive, and like the third row has become the new it thing, right? And so they're putting it into every possible vehicle. And it's kind of funny because when you put it into like a, a compact crossover, you know, like the Rogue had it for a while, right? It makes, or, you know, the other one that has it now, of course, is the Outlander, right? It makes for very little to no space behind that third row. Yeah, and of course, I think the Tiguan has it. Yeah. Right, the little Tiguan. But the Grand Cherokee is bigger than those vehicles. So Is there space behind the third row when there, it's up? There is, yeah. It's pretty big. So what they're doing with the latest generation, which if you want to know the fancy term, yeah. WL. Okay. They are now going That's to do... That's the model, the internal model designation. They're w. going to do two versions of it. So they're going to do the L. And the LL. No. 
<laughs> the L is long. <laughs> the L is the one that I went and got to see in person in Detroit, and then a little bit down the road, we're going to see a shorter version, which is the two row. So very interesting that they're they're launching the three row first. I think that they're really pushing the L. Um, I think that internally there's a lot of discussion that perhaps the three row is going to sell better than the two row, and they want to come out of the gates blazing with the long one. Well, I mean, you know, given the choice between being able to seat five or seven. Right, people are more likely to go for the more room just because it'll give you more utility. Having said that, Tommy, I am a bit confused because I know that me and you recently went to look at the Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer, and those are also three row. Yes, now those are more based on like the pickup truck, like right. the Ram. So this is a unibody. Uh, those, the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer, are like a truck and they're bigger. All right, so come along with me for a ride to the local Jeep dealership, right? Yep. I walk in, I'm like, hey, I need a big old family crossover slash SUV, right? Yeah, and, and they'll say... And I walk in and there's a Jeep Grand Cherokee that's got three rows, there's a Wagoneer that's got three rows, and then there's a Grand Wagoneer that's got three rows. What What's the difference? I mean, you know, which one is going to be the one that I'm going to buy? Well, currently none of them because... they're you, not out yet. Yeah, well, no, because you go into the dealers and they're going to be like, well, they ran out of chips. But... <laughs> they're all coming this year, by the way. Uh, yeah, when they do um, eventually get chips, <laughs> yeah. uh, they're saying that the uh, new Grand Cherokee L is, is going to be in dealers in the next 60 days. Right. So it's based on price point, really, right? So the Grand Cherokee L starts at under 40 k Okay. Okay. Um, so if, the, I want, if I want the least expensive one, I'm going to go for the Grand Wagoneer. No, the most expensive one, I'm going to go for the Grand Wagoneer. If I want the least expensive one, I'm going to go with the Grand Cherokee. L, that's correct. Oh. And then the Wagoneer slots in the middle. So here's a pricing breakdown. All right, let's hear it. The Grand Cherokee L starts under 40. Uh, Wagoneer yeah. is like mid to high 50s. But I bet you if you load up the L, you're going to get to that mid-entry mid point of the Wagoneer, aren't oh, you? Oh, yeah, you can get the L, the Grand Cherokee L, until the 60s. Okay, so and, they overlap. Yeah, there's overlap. Mm -hmm. And then if you want the ultimate Escalade competitor, you buy the Grand Wagoneer, which is going to be the crazy one with all the tech and all the cool goodies. As far as I can tell, what will determine which one I buy is the towing capability, <laughs> because I know the Grand Wagoneer tows like 8,000 pounds. Um, so actually, this is where things are interesting. Yeah. I think that the Grand Wagoneer is like closer to nine or ten. Yeah, it's a lot. This is seventy-two hundred. I don't think that's what's going to sway your purchasing decision. Okay, what's going to sway? It? Well, just the size of it. I mean, can you what, park it? The salesman pointing me to the one that that he is going to get a discount. <laughs> no, uh, is going to is going to get the biggest bonus on. Is that what's going to sway my buying decision? <laughs> fuel economy, big deal. <laughs> okay, parking, uh -huh. um, capability. And then whether or not you're going to be using that third row all the time. I did sit in the third row of this. Yeah, how is it? It's very good. Okay. It's actually very good. They designed it for adults. So let's talk about the styling. What do you what do you think of the look of the new Grand Cherokee? It's evolutionary. I think you know they did a good job in continuing that uh, theme that it's had for the last uh, decade or so. Uh, you know, it's not groundbreaking. Uh, it doesn't you know like jump out at you and say this is a completely new vehicle, but there is a strong lineage going back to the original. I think it's cool. I really like what they've done. So Mark, the chief designer, is telling me that they they slanted the front grille. So if you look at it, rather than kind of sloping toward the front of it, it actually slopes toward the rear of it. It's got this inverted angle. Yeah. And that's because they wanted to extend the hood. So that allowed them to extend the hood relative to the total length cool. of the vehicle. Yeah. And they said it looks stupid if you've got a short hood and a long roof. Doesn't the uh, um, wagon do that too, though? It also slants. A, a little bit. Yeah. But that one's, got, thing, though. that one's got these um, body-colored... Uh, pillars and the Grand Wagoneer does not have the body colored pillars. Hey, I'm going to interrupt this podcast for a moment of a style critique. Um, and this isn't really critique, it's just what you'll see coming very soon, or if you haven't already seen it. Have you noticed that they've started putting the name of the vehicle in bold letters on the back of the tailgate now? It's, it's a thing now. You chose the one vehicle that doesn't do that. Yeah, but like the Wagoneer doesn't. <laughs> They well, and, and we just have a Taos out there right now, the little baby, uh, you know, Volkswagen. Yep. It's also got Taos written across the back, and so does the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder, the same thing. So that's become like it's a styling trend you'll see a lot from now on. Not only will you see the like the long tail light that goes across the entire thing, which, having spoken to designers, they say that that gives it a better stance. It makes it look wider. But they're now putting the name of the vehicle in bold, either chrome letters or some kind of you know, uh, very like. Um, prominent, bold font across the back of it. So how about this? What about when they put the model designation on the front? 
Like Telluride has got it spelled out on the front. Defender spelled out on the front. It's another style. It's another thing. Yeah, yeah. So the Grand Cherokee L does not have any of that. But there are a bunch of different trims. So it starts with Laredo, goes all the way up to the top. I think it's called the Summit Reserve. Mm -hmm. And that one, you know, you're pushing close to 70K. They do look quite different from each other. They all have LED headlights, I noticed. But some of them have tow hooks in the front, some of them don't. Some of them have black plastic along the uh, the bottom portion, some of them don't. You can get it up to 21-inch wheels, which is a first for the Grand Cherokee. So, uh, actually, let's take a little side trip down uh, off-road lane. Yeah. Um, and before we talk about how how uh, what kind of different off-road systems are in the... Uh, Grand Cherokee. Uh, yesterday we took our uh, Subaru that we just purchased, the Crosstrek, and we took it up by uh, Goldmine, no, not Goldmine Hill, God, I'm getting old, uh, Tombstone Hill. I miss Goldmine Hill, by the way. That was a good hill. It was fine. I like Tombstone more. It's gotten harder. All right, yeah, it's gotten harder. And we took it up against the Taos, right? And we had a long discussion about what makes an off-roader, and I think we came to a consensus, Tommy, which was what? What are the two things that make a true off-roader, or at least make an off-roader in such a way that the manufacturer acknowledges that it's a true off-roader? Well, and I think that's key, that last part that you said. It's not necessarily what makes a true off-roader, but I think it is a sign that the vehicle manufacturer intended this to be used off-road on the regular. And the two things are a low-range transfer case and integrated recovery points. So the low range transfer case is key, basically a four wheel drive low that multiplies the torque. It basically saves the drivetrain in off-road situations. So you're not building up heat, it gives you so much more control. So it's not a snorkel and a roof rack? And not a snorkel <laughs> and a roof rack or plastic cladding. <laughs> okay. No, uh, but the recovery point is also a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. <laughs> because a lot of vehicles now incorporate like the little twisty hook, right? right? You, you pop the little plastic thing and you twist the and hook. You, you know, those are meant for like transporting across the ocean to hold them on the boat so they don't go sliding into each other. They're not meant to be pulling three or four times the vehicle's weight, which can happen if you're stuck in, like, mud. Right. And you can, you know, rip off the front fascia or hurt someone. I mean, it's a bad deal if you really get yeah. in a situation where that, that little hook breaks off. So, tying it back into the Grand Cherokee, the Grand Cherokee can have both. Not every Grand Cherokee has both. Right. But certain trims of the Grand Cherokee have both a low range and recovery points. So for example, um, diving into the four-wheel drive systems a little bit, yeah. you can get it in rear-wheel drive, uh, but don't do that. No. Uh, or you can get it in three different... Unless you live in Florida, maybe. No, just don't do that. Hawaii? Uh, nope. Uh, Incorrect. Uh, I'm California? saying if you got a Jeep, nope. You got to have four-wheel drive. Okay. Because a four-wheel drive is not a big price increase. I think it's like $2,000. Definitely get it. If, you, if you're going to buy a Jeep and you're going to get a front-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive Jeep, just don't. Just go go get yourself something else. This is rear-wheel drive. but sorry, just... sorry, Mark, if you're listening. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to you know kill your sales, Mark. Mark or... Um, you know, hurt the brand, but I feel very um, strongly um, that a Jeep should be four-wheel drive. Okay, so there are three different four-wheel drive systems. There's a basic four-wheel drive system called the Quadratrack 1. Right. There's an upgraded four-wheel drive system called the Quadratrack 2. Yeah. And then the top dog is the Quadra Drive 2. The differences are when you go quadra track one to quadra track two, you get a low range, and then quadra track two to quadra drive two, you get a special electronic limited slip rear diff. Cool. Yeah, and um, I can't talk about how it drives off road. We've right. got a full video coming up on that soon. Okay. But we did do some pretty gnarly four wheel driving in the uh, Grand Cherokee, and uh, you're definitely going to want to stay tuned for that. So the big differences on the Grand Cherokee are on the inside. Yeah, so you got to hang out with like the big uh, bosses there, right? You got to see Jim Morrison, who runs the brand, right? I did, yep. You got to see Mark Allen. I got to meet the chief engineer yeah. and the chief interior what, designer. What was there like? You know, sometimes you can get a sense for how how happy they are with the vehicle, how proud they are of it. What was the vibe coming from those guys? Well, I think that they they knew how important this vehicle was. Okay. So I was talking to the chief engineer and he told me that when he got the assignment for the new Grand Cherokee, I mean, he, he was like a little bit in shock for a sec because yes, it's very cool, he said that you know, you're assigned to this, but it's such an important part of the Jeep brand. Mark Allen actually described it as one of two pillars of the Jeep brand, hmm. Grand Cherokee and Wrangler. Yeah, I was talking to, uh, this is a long time ago, I was talking to the chief engineer for the F-150 and I said, what's it like to be the chief engineer for that? He said, it's horrible. There's just so much pressure on you from the brand to make this a success, right? Because it's the goose that laid the golden egg. It's the, it's the you know, the, the golden vehicle of the brand. And so I can see that, yeah, if there's a lot of pressure, don't, you know, mess it up. I think from a powertrain standpoint, they didn't want to touch 
uh, what they were comfortable with. So the same powertrains? It, almost exactly the same. So currently there's going to be a 3.6 V6 yeah. Pentastar and then a 5.7 V8. Yeah. Uh, we've heard rumors of a plug-in hybrid. Um, we, you know, no eco diesel offering yet, just the two. Okay. Same as the current one. Uh, transmission pretty similar, but the big, I think a lot of the big push came with refinement on the interior. Yeah, what's the interior like? I heard it's beautiful. It's really cool. From the grapevine, I've heard they really, you know, FCA and now Stellantis has really been upping the interior, their interior game. It's the first Jeep I have ever been in where I couldn't notice parts from a parts bin. So if you look at the window switches, the lock buttons, the door handles, it all feels brand new and different. I mean, like you, you get into like an old Grand Cherokee and then you get into a compass and you get into a chair and it's like, it feels like it's all the same DNA. You get into this thing, you got rid of the Jeep brand and you have no idea what you're sitting in. I mean, it's it's really an interesting ground up now, take. Now you've been in both the Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer, and now the uh, Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee. You know, I was really blown away by the interior and the Grand Wagoneer. Has it kind of, is it like Grand Wagoneer light, I guess is the question. No. Interior is really different than the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer. It feels much kind of more curvy. It feels less blocky. feels m more cohesive, in my opinion. Um, unique steering wheel. It's got three 10-inch screens available. Okay. 10-inch main screen, Uconnect 5. 10-inch instrument cluster screen. 10-inch um, heads-up display. Okay. Night vision. Now, now um, how about the leather quality, piece it's, of plastics? Yeah, so you can get it with this, um, uh, what is that called? The, the pleated leather with the little triangles? Diamond stitched. Diamond stitched? Diamond stitched leather. And they said they have dual diamond stitched leathers. Whoa. So each diamond has dual stitching. Yeah. And apparently the seat supplier was furious when they made this request. Because they, they thought it would just be too crazy expensive. But Jeep, they were like, we're going to do it this way. Um, th they went nuts with the real metal. So everything that looks like metal that, that you touch is metal. So the drive control looks like metal. In the past, it's been some bottle top thing. Okay. Now it's, it's real metal. Um, the uh, adjustability for the drive modes, real metal, the paddles. All, I mean, the switches like are just out of this world. And even the base one, I even sat in the base trim. Obviously, you don't get the wood or the massaging seats or any of that. But it still feels pretty good. You get like a big screen or a baby screen you get the baby screen okay All yeah right. so there's a more baby screen it's not the full 10 inch sure and then um now you did go off-road but once again you can't talk about it uh you know but did you uh um well, well we, we got to play with the tech yeah that's what i mean didn't so uh, the loaded one i drove had night vision yeah it's like a screen that, that does heat signatures the night vision it has new off-road pages which are super sophisticated um, four corner air suspension um, heated seats ventilated seats four zone automatic climate control wow luxurious panoramic sunroof how much was that bad boy you hey, you're pushing 60 yeah. in the one i was in yeah with it also the off-road group in it but yeah really cool stuff front facing camera rear facing camera had the trail cam with the squirter for example uh, it's got pretty much everything you'd expect in a luxury car but it still has some of that Jeep stuff. So like a Mercedes or, or a, a BMW is not going to have uh, off-road pages that right. show your articulation and steering position and what the traction control is doing. This one does. Um, I was actually quite impressed. I'm a little bit worried about the powertrains, that they didn't change them enough. Hmm. Um, and I think there's a small percentage of people that are not going to be blown away with the fuel economy because... The ratings I saw were all like mid to high teens. Okay, is that embargoed? I just said driving impressions. Okay, all right. Well, well let's wait until we officially announce it. Mm -hmm. Until they officially announce it. I, th I think they have officially announced yeah. it. You want to look? You want to keep looking and uh, uh, because it is coming very soon uh, to a Jeep dealership near you. We're very close to, to. And the one part you didn't get to go is on the factory tour, right? They did the fact they, have, they built an entire factory to build this. Yeah, it's a it's a huge investment on their part in, in Detroit, right? In Detroit, that's exactly right. So the air suspension is pretty cool too. I was talking to the chief engineer. It's actually a closed loop system, yeah. which means that they are um, basically right, like the X5, X7. It's a little more expensive to do a closed loop so that you don't keep adding air to it. So it always stays in there. So it uh, doesn't need as much compression from the compressor because it's not coming from the outside. It's a more expensive way to do air suspension. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I was really pretty impressed with it. All right, all right. Well, shall we move on to the uh, S Class while you're doing some uh, uh, Googling over there, trying to figure out if the fuel economy numbers have, are up? And by the way, I take it you're, I thought you were on EPA.gov. No, I was looking at oh. people have published. By the way, it. If, if you ever, if, if people have, mm -hmm. 
if you ever uh, want to know what the fuel economy is of something, just go to epa.gov, uh, I think, right? And uh, you can pick the, uh, why don't you go to epa.gov, see if it's up there. If it's there, it's there. That's the official <laughs> EPA site that lets you uh, basically search for any vehicle and it'll give you the fuel economy numbers. That's right. That's a good resource. And the other good resource is if you want to see how, car is, how cars and trucks are selling, go to Good Car, Bad Car. Uh, that's a really cool website that allows you to uh, go and see sales numbers and you can see how your favorite car is selling or not selling. All right, truck. so it, it is officially announced. Yeah, okay. so 2021 Grand Cherokee L four-wheel drive with the V8 was rated at 17 combined. Hmm, yeah, it's a big vehicle. It's a big vehicle, exactly. Um, and, and let's face it, look, the Pentastar has been around forever. So, you know, it's pretty much sorted. So if you're worried about, it's not, it doesn't have the newest tech. It's not direct injected, for instance. But if you don't, you know, if you want something that's reliable, that's been... Uh, thoroughly vetted, then the Pentastar is a good powertrain. Yeah, I mean, so we're still missing a lot of news, right? So they haven't announced the Trailhawk version, okay, which is the big cheese off-road version. Right. And I don't think there'll be a Trackhawk. What about yeah, SRT? Are they going to do a Trackhawk? Are they going to do an SRT? I doubt it. Why? Because they because everything's going electric, and that that's just you know their EPA numbers would even be worse. Interesting. And the cafe numbers would even be worse. They did a really nice job. So this is a new UConnect system, UConnect Five. Yeah. It's. Um, upgraded over the Uconnect 4. It, like, if you know how the 4 system works, you'll know how the 5 works. But the 5 is just quicker. It looks better. It's sharper, yeah. We've, we've actually sharper. have videos of it. We've done yeah, because like we were in the Durango. Yeah, exactly. So if, check out our Durango video and you'll you'll see... The this does not feel like a Durango, by the way. It shouldn't. Which I thought was a whole different vehicle. <laughs> Feels super different, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the four-corner air suspension goes up to 10.9 inches. Wow. If you get the off-road group, you can get it, get it with Goodyear Wrangler tires. You can get it with skid plates. Um, obviously the recovery points and yet yeah, you're going to want to stay tuned for that offer video because the Jeep Jamboree guys actually set up a, a course so we went to the Chelsea Proving Grounds uh -huh. and they, they built a custom course specifically they for let, this they event. let you in there without like giving them a sample of your blood that's and, always hard to get yeah, into yeah we had to go through like three sets of security to get in there yeah because they, they get all the prototypes running around yeah once we were in there um they went pretty nuts with the course. So, like, you can really tell how the vehicle is marketed depending on how the off-road course is on the press launch. Yeah, I just did the uh, Toyota program where they did all their off-roaders, the Tacoma, the Tundra, the 4Runner, uh, the GX, the LX, and uh, they built a course, but it wasn't very challenging. Yeah, this course was like we had to have spotters on, on the vast majority of it. And it's, it's, I was talking to the big G's there, Jim, I'm like, oof. Man, I wouldn't do that with my Grand Cherokee, but it's cool that they were like, yeah, have at it. See what yeah. it'll do. Yeah, Jeep is serious about their off-roading. Uh, I think so is Land Rover in general. Yep, Land Rover in general. Uh, I so actually, I think that people are going to cross-shop this with the Defender. I think if you are looking at a loaded um, Grand Cherokee, I think a Defender might also be in your wheelhouse. Maybe, but the Defender starts where this kind of leaves off. Well, I mean, even, even our cheap Defender was 54, I think 55, and they've raised the prices on them since then, Tommy. So a cheap Defender is going to be 60 now. Yeah, but this goes well into the mid-60s. Yeah, but you know, it goes Defender well will go well into the, the hundreds. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, granted, it's a different class, but I do think there's potentially a small number of people that, rather than looking at the BMW, are going to go look at the Grand Cherokee. You mean 21-inch wheels? Mean, okay. You yeah. know, 21-inch wheels. It's got the adaptive. I think you mean Land Rover, not. BMW. No, I do mean BMW. I'm talking about premium brands. Oh, I, I think see. That they're going to be some premium brand people. Like X5 looking at or this. X7 cross shoppers. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think they didn't make this more rugged, which is going to upset some folks, but they made it so much more refined than the current one. And I think that's where a lot of their their market lives. So, so, so I can, now can I talk about the S-Class? Yes, let's hear it. We have delved the depths of Jeep Grand Cherokee. So I went on the S-Class, of course. Uh, and as you know, Tommy, Mercedes considers the S-Class their kind of the height of their technological and luxury-oriented uh, uh, vehicle. So yep. a lot of the tech that's introduced in the S-Class eventually rolls down to the other ones. Uh, and uh, it's very conservative. Uh, if you throw it up there, if you do, if you find it, you'll find that from the outside, um, it's it's not exactly like you, you know. If you saw one down the road, it, you wouldn't like probably do a double um, double spin to to, to to see it. It's just it's very conservative. If but you has, get if you get up close and personal, then you start to see cool little details, like you know the the little tiny lights that make up the rear LED lights, uh, you know, or the um, that's a Maybach. Yeah, that's, that's not, I didn't drive that one. I wish oh. I could have, uh, but I didn't drive Is it a 22 one. or a 21? 21. Mercedes-Benz oh, I'm looking class. at 22s. Yeah, the Maybach is coming. Anyway, it starts at about, I don't know, I think the one I was driving started like 120 and and I was in $149,000. And the headline is they've actually uh, gone with um, all-wheel steering or rear-wheel steering. And I know that's not new 
quadrasteer, as Kent would say, or uh, you know, 300 ZXI once owned had uh, rear wheel steering. But what they did was they gave a 10 degrees timing of rear wheel steering, which is a lot. Yeah, geez. A ten, a ton. Ten, 10 degrees is just, you can just really, yeah, you can see how much it steers. And it gives it the same turning radius as an A class, believe it or not. So you've got this big, it's a long, it's a, I mean, there's two versions of it. There's a regular version and a long version. And in America, we're only getting the long version. So it's about the same length as a full size pickup truck. Okay. But imagine a full size pickup truck being able to turn in the same turning radius as a uh, um, A class. Can you find the picture of it? Is yeah, I've got it right there. Oh, there you go. So yeah. just just looking at the it's very um, conservatively styled. And wait. go to our website if you want to see uh, the video of my first kind of impressions. Just go to TFL Car. It's up there. I will say uh, the Mercedes S class has never been the one though to break styling norms. You know, it's always been pretty uh, pretty subdued in its style because I think an S class buyer. Uh, maybe is coming from another one and doesn't want want them to reinvent the wheel in terms of design. So it's definitely more evolution than, than changing there's the exterior. The interior looks cool though. So talk to me about that big screen. It's like yeah, a 12.8. Yeah, huge screen. Uh, and uh, the, the screen in front of you does something I've never seen before. And you can actually have it go 3D. Whoa. So, so it's like it doesn't look flat. It looks like if you're watching those old like 70s or 80s or 60s movies with the glasses, it's actually three dimensional. Is it like the Tesla where they get rid of all the hard buttons? They got rid of most of the hard buttons. Uh, it uses MBUX, uh, which is Mercedes-Benz's, uh, you know, infotainment system. But yeah, so there's a 3D screen that you can turn on and off. The other cool thing is, remember how the old phones had that fingerprint? Uh, the old iPhones had the fingerprint recognition. Oh yeah. It has that now. So oh really? You can touch your fingerprint to a little reader, and then it adjusts all your personalized settings just for you. That's crazy. So like if you know, like your phone, your seating position, your preferred temperature. Basically, it says, oh. This is Roman, and I'm going to adjust not only the car to your, his specifications, but also load all of his private uh, data as well. So if you're not, you know, if you're not touching it, nobody else can basically get at your like address book or other private data. I think that, the interior. I think the interior looks brilliant, especially this kind of like floating center screen that's like the 12.8 inch screen. At least in pictures, it looks like the ultimate version of MBUX, kind of like a square. You know, it's not long and skinny. Um, it's not short and fat. It's almost like a perfect square in its design. And it's got the, uh, those really nice seats with the optional headrest, it looks like. The one, the one thing that is a little finicky uh, is they went to, you know, like touch controls on almost everything. Remember in the past, like, when you wanted to move the seat, Mercedes has a seat-shaped control, right? Yep. And in the old one, you would, like, if you wanted to move the backrest up or down, you would push on that, on that backrest part. This one, all you do is touch it, so they're all, like, touch-sensitive. Uh, and I, I kind of miss the real feel. I like the feel of actually things happening, like a switch working or, uh, you know, uh, a, a real, not just a haptic feel, but actually a real feel. And I think uh, especially like the ones on the steering wheel where you have a lot of control, just a ton of controls on the steering wheel, uh, it can get a little um, confusing. It is interesting. So if I'm looking at the engine lineup here, um, they're, they're going to offer two engines, an S500 and an S580. Yeah, we were in the 580, which is the uh, 496 pound-foot of torque, 516 horsepower, twin turbo. Other way. Or the other way. Maybe it's uh, 516 pound-foot of torque and 496 horsepower, like yeah. I was saying. Yeah, by turbo V8. But why is the S500 a straight six? Shouldn't that be a five liter? It's also, it's also a 48 volt hybrid. Yeah, but shouldn't the S500 be a five liter and the S580 be a 5.8 liter? One cannot figure out the mystique of German naming conventions. On, I've given up on that, Tommy. So uh, I, I no longer, you know, even have that as a reference in my brain with any of the Germans. So yeah, so the, you know, the one I drove, like I say, was the uh, big twin turbo V8. Uh, it's got a 48 volt system that gives you, I think 21, it can't really, um, it's got a little motor that's sandwiched in between the nine speed and the, you know, and the, and the uh, engine. Uh, I think it produces an extra 21 horsepower, but it doesn't really, you can't really drive around on all electricity. It's just a mild hybrid. Mild hybrid. Now I, I'm noticing on the website, it says pricing coming soon. Yeah. So um, we'll probably have to wait a little bit to see what the, exactly what the pricing is. Yeah, the, sure. the total price yeah. line is like, but I, I think it's um, it's a nice looking S class. You know, the S class is kind of like the Grand Cherokee, where they they don't come around very often. Every seven years. Is it seven? Every seven. Is it not more than seven? It's every seven. Oh wow. Okay, that's interesting. You're like locusts. Like <laughs> like a locust. <laughs> every seven years is the S class. So if you want something a little crazier. Um, and what I like about this kind of two-prong method is they've got the S-Class, which right. is gasoline, and it's more or less familiar. And then if you want, uh, you know, the electric Tycon Tesla thing, right. you can get the EQS. 
right? So they're, they're doing the all-electric one as well. And that one is supposed to kind of reinvent the wheel. One, so of, the, one of those isn't coming. They, they gave up on one of them. One of the electric ones is the not EQC coming. The EQC is the one that's that, not coming. that they – yeah, the EQS is the giant sedan okay. that's all electric. So I love – I kind of like that approach where the gasoline one's a little bit more conservative in its approach and then the electric one is nuts. Well, but I mean it's not conservative. It's conservative in styling. It's not conservative in its technology. It's, it's, I would say it's quite overwhelming in its tech. You know, so you've got you know, the full suite of safety systems, of course. You know, I, I can't really talk about driving. Once again, there's a driving impression, but then there is you know, a full you know, autonomous suite of tools that, that let you, you know, do what Teslas will do. Uh, there is also, of course, the ultimate luxury by sitting in the back, right? So the, 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 the passenger side back seat is where, like, you know, if you're being driven around, you sit. So it's like a private jet airplane seat. It almost reclines fully. It has, you know, the little um, lower footrest that comes up, right? Um, it has its own screen. Here's something cool. So on the screen on the back of it, which is part of that technology package, you can actually monitor what your driver is driving like. So instance, it gives you a little display of like how much throttle he's using or how much brake he's using. So if you tell Jeeves to step on it, he doesn't, you can see that as well. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, and I'm not seeing any word on a, um, uh, AMG version. There probably is one coming. Like I said, there's a Maybach coming. So there's definitely an AMG version coming as well. Of course, there's always an AMG version coming. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I asked how many they sell a year. He said, I think in a good year, they'll sell like 20,000 of them, which is still a lot. I thought it'd be much less than that because it's a very expensive vehicle. It's also, you know, not a hot class considering everyone's moving to crossovers, even in the ultra luxury segment, you got like the GLS, but that's, yeah, well, that, that's funny. kind of a I, lot. I still think in a way they own that class, right? So uh, if, you, if you're going to see a big, you know, long wheelbase sedan, it's not going to be a seven series. It's not going to be an A8. It's probably going to be a Mercedes Benz S class, right? What about a Lexus, an LS? Yeah, once again, I think Mercedes is the one, is the leader it's in that. It's a gold standard, okay. And they've always kind of, and the other cool thing it has, by the way, it's got the five-pointed star that kind of leans back. So it still has an upright uh, hood ornament. I like that. I, I think it's cool. I really love it a lot. I'd love to drive it. I'm jealous that you got to go on that program. It's really nice looking. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, me and Nick uh, Miles, my friend, were ensconced in the lap of luxury driving this thing around. Uh, and you do really feel like privileged when you're behind the wheel. I gotta say, I've never felt uh, a softer leather steering wheel, like a baby's <laughs> bottom, literally. It was like a baby's bottom holding onto this thing. It was so luxurious. Uh, and then it's got this really cool little like neck slash uh, head pillow that you can move up and down. That if you put your head back there, you are in serious danger of falling asleep while driving. All right, so now they've gone over the two vehicles that we went and saw. Let's let's kind of jump and talk about what we promised that we talk about, which is the Maverick. Tell me about that. Right. So I got to go get a first-hand look at the upcoming Ford Maverick. Now that is a small little truck, smaller than the Ranger. It's about a foot shorter than a Ranger. Some of the headline numbers: it, it'll start at under 20k. I don't think you'll ever see one for under 20K, but it'll start at 19,995. It's got a standard hybrid system, 2.5 liter four cylinder with the hybrid technology, uh, optional turbocharged gas engine with optional all wheel drive. Um, the hybrid is a CVT and front wheel drive. And it's going to go, I think Andre said, into the mid to high $30,000 range. I think 37 is. 37 is. I was reading a story where somebody spec'd it out. It was like 36 plus destination. So, four and a half foot bed. It's got um, 4,000 pounds of towing capacity, 2,000 pounds if you get the hybrid. And then payload's really high, up to 1,500 pounds. So, did you like it? Um, you get to stand next to it. You get to crawl over it. I, I mean, liked, we, and you also got to go and check out the Santa Cruz, right? Yes. Which is also coming. What is it coming, by the way? So the Ford is coming apparently in fall of 2020. The Santa Cruz, which is a Hyundai version, yeah, of a little pickup truck, is coming now. Right. So uh, I I liked a lot of parts of the Maverick. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the design. I, I think like they, if you're going to do a small truck, right, you can really get creative with the styling and, and your approach. Mm -hmm. And I think Ford was very conservative, and perhaps it was a smart decision, but it's very boxy, very flat, flat sided. Very trucky. Yeah, and my least favorite part is the way they've incorporated the the cab and the bed, obviously unibody, but it's basically like a 90 degree angle, which is fine, but it kind of gives it these little bit ungainly proportions. I think that the price is excellent. Um, if the fuel economy is actually what they stated is, 37 combined on the hybrid, that would be incredible. Yeah, I got to tell you, so, you know, 
I love small trucks. I'm glad that they built it. I know there's going to be an off-road package. But once again, like I would not buy a Jeep that's not four-wheel or all-wheel drive. I would not buy a truck that's front-wheel drive. I just can't get my head around it. Sorry. So you, you can get all-wheel drive. I know. I know. But I'm saying I, can't get, I can't get my head around a, a CVT front-wheel drive truck. It's if, just, it, that, that's not a truck anymore. That's like a Bronco Sport with a bed. Well, it basically is a Bronco Sport with a bed. So it's the same architecture, C2 architecture. doesn't have the optional cool rear differential as the Bronco Sport. 8.6 inches of ground clearance. There's an optional FX4. I think they're going to sell the beans out of these. I really do. I think there's been a big kind of gap in the markets. The Ranger's gotten so big. The sure. Tacoma, the Colorado. Even the Frontier and especially the Ridgeline. Yeah. Um, the four and a half foot bed, it's not going to work for like contractors. <laughs> you, no. you know, it's not going to work for people that are on a ranch. Look, I, I I would be the first one to raise my hand for the four wheel drive, right, with the bigger power plant. It's it's. But I think that's the one to get. Not really four wheel. It's all wheel drive. Right, it doesn't have that, a low range transfer right, case. But neither does the Santa Cruz. No. So the Santa Cruz has a lot more kind of spunk to it. It's got this interesting design with that crazy grill and the LEDs. Right. It's got the integrated tonneau cover. It's got the bed trunk. Right. Ford doesn't have the bed trunk. Um, the Ford is very conventional, like, truck. Here we have a truck. And I, I think that is a good approach for a vast majority of buyers. But the Hyundai's got a lot more personality to it. Um, it's also got more towing capacity. Hyundai's saying up to 5,000. It's also got more power in its biggest engine with the Hyundai. But I think the, the Ford is going to be successful. Now, the interior is kind of interesting. I sat in the XLT Hybrid. I love the seats. Once again, there's a video over at TFL Truck if you want to see it. Yep, I love the seats. It's got these denim, denim cloth seats that look really cool. I like the white material on the dashboard. Did not really like the sync system. It's an old, old sync system. And it's weird. It's just weird because it, you can clearly tell that it was supposed to be like a 12-inch screen. And then they decided to make it an 8-inch screen and just put another cubby next to it. So a little bit weird on that. Um, and it's a little chintzy. Like, uh, the dash material is nice. But once you start looking away from the dash, things are get, you know, a little budget. It's got a traditional key. I really didn't like the gauges on the hybrid. I mean, they didn't include bezels on the, the, little, the little standard gauges. I'm like, guys, come on. I don't want to look at a black piece of plastic with numbers tacked onto it. Um, but having said that, rear seat room felt very good. Really impressed. I like the underseat storage. I thought the underseat storage was good. Um, I do think that the towing capacity with the Max Tow Group is pretty decent, 4,000 pounds. And if you get the Max Tow Group, you also get the integrated trailer brake controller. That's excellent. So I'm, I'm kind of half and half. We're going to have to wait and drive it and see how it tows and how it goes off road and how it works as like a little trucklet. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of Bronco Sport with the bed, the Bronco's coming soon. Uh, big Bronco. Big Bronco's coming soon. So uh, before we wrap this up, Tommy, I kind of wanted to go over, uh, since we're kind of in spring cleaning mode, I wanted to go over our long-term test fleet and kind of talk about, you know, what, what we're what we have, what we've been testing, what our experience has been with those vehicles. Uh, so let's kind of quickly go through the vehicles that we have. I'll tell you the ones we sold. We just sold our uh, long-term Raptor. And if you want to know how we lived with that, we had it for 6,000 miles. Uh, Andre and Nathan just did a podcast basically talking about that on the TRX. So I'm not going to go into those two. Yep. We're holding on to the TRX. We sold the Raptor. We're waiting. We're hopefully going to get at some point our hands on uh, the new Raptor. So we want to have the TRX to compare against it. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, Let's talk about the ones that, uh, you know, the other ones that we sold. So we sold the old um, Chevy, the, the 1998 Chevy. Yep. We, we just sold the 01 Ram. 01 Ram. Uh, the, uh, these are the vehicles that we had for no payment needed to hell and back. Uh, we also uh, kept the old Ford F-150, the 2004. Yep. We're going to... As our shop truck. going to be just a runaround shop truck. Yeah. For sure. Um, so on the classic side, we've got the Pathfinder. Um, I may have a p plan for the Pathfinder. Been kind of kind of dreaming some stuff up. What year is it? Um, it's a uh, 95 first yeah. gen Pathfinder. First gen, last of the first gens. Yep. We also have got a, the really cool orange truck. The F100. Also work, working on a plan on that. I got some ideas. Yeah, Tommy's got a lot of plans. I got a lot of plans. I just gotta execute the plans. Um, uh -huh. We just bought a Subaru, so a cross truck. Yeah, we just did a video where we compared it to the uh, Taos, which they directly compete going up Tombstone, as we talked about. The Volkswagen. Yep. Yeah. So what you, you you're doing? We we found that the the Subaru has a little, we've got the little tiny engine. The two liter and it's lacking in air conditioning so you're doing a video on trying to measure which one has a better air conditioning. Well, it has air conditioning it yeah, just it it's not a very good air conditioning. Above 90 it, it struggles. Yeah it gets pretty stuck. So we've got that. Um, How about the FJ? FJ Cruiser still sticking around not doing a whole much with it but I really like that, that, that truck. I think it's a really good um, good vehicle. We've got I've got my classic mini still got the Land Rover 
Yeah, yeah t- let's talk about that. So, you know, our third Land Rover, it's been pretty good. We've put 6,000 miles on it. You just drove it on a road trip to South Dakota. Yep. And then you also ro- drove it to Moab. Yep. Tell me what you think of it as a road trip vehicle. Excellent road trip vehicle. One of my favorites. Yeah, it really is airy. It's tall, great ride. Uh, and uh, the only thing that's gone wrong with it, besides the fact that this is our third one, is that you said that the uh, screen kind of died on you. Right? Yeah. The, the infotainment died. The infotainment bricked itself for about 25 minutes, and that was pretty annoying. But then it came back for no reason. So fixed itself. Uh, that's been very good. People, we have noticed that we've got this kind of um, cream-colored interior, which is made of this, this I don't know, unique kind of... It's like, like a woven, woven cloth. Material. Yeah. That gets dirty very easily, and it's hard to keep clean. And it frays. If I've seen, if you look at the auto show ones, too, they seem to fray pretty quickly. So yeah. I'm not a big fan of that seat bolstering material. We, we actually got an email from somebody who was so upset about it that they wanted us to try to do, like, a recall. And, like, uh, you know, yeah. there, there's a year wait now for any... Any defenders out there? So I don't think that. Yeah, the really lady who emailed us complaining about the um, the seat issue actually sold hers for 10k over sticker, after she owned it for a little while. Model Y Tesla still going strong. Yeah, that one. Uh, we're about to swap out the tires back to summer tires, and uh, I was telling Tommy if and when the Rivian's out. Uh, by the way, if you're a manufacturer, we have a new policy for for you if you're interested. Obviously, we have you know an audience that stretches into about 30 million listeners and viewers monthly between our TikTok channel, between our um, YouTube channel, between the podcast, uh, and that's a pretty substantial audience. So you know, if if we um, are privileged enough to be able to buy the vehicle and then do a long-term review. Uh, and if you want to provide us with one of those vehicles, not for free, we'll buy it, then we will be happily uh, you know, put it in our rotation. And the one that we're interested in doing right now is Rivian. So Rivian, if you're listening, you know, one of the things I think would be cool would be to trade that Model Y in, um, on a Rivian. Uh, and so we'd certainly love to do that and test the very first all-electric truck, which should be coming any day now. But once again, uh, you know, if if you if we have to wait six months or a year before we can buy one through the regular channels, then at that point, honestly, the interest is gone, uh, and it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to buy it. So if you know, if you want your vehicle, uh, and if we have the budget and the interest in buying it, contact us, let us know, and you know, we'll be happy to purchase it and get it out there in front of our readers and viewers. Um, so that's a, that's a standing offer to anybody. If if Rivian doesn't do it, then probably the plan with the Model Y will be to uh, trade it on a Cybertruck if and when that comes out. Yeah. But it's been good. You know, it, it it's been you know the uh, the um, the build quality isn't grand. You know, uh, the 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 panels still don't line up. Uh, but for you were just driving it today. Did you have fun with it? I did. I love it. Yep. Um, very good range. Very good performance. Good room. Uh, so it's getting a little squeaky after 6,000 miles. It is miles. squeaky. It's There's just... a lot of plastic rubbing on plastic. Yep. And the, the one thing I have noticed, which is a little bit um, sad, is that when we first had the so we've had a Model 3, then we had a Model X, and now we've got the Model Y. When we had the Model 3, they would actually uh, up date the software and we would actually get performance differences and they would tell you you know now your zero to 60 time is greater or your range is bigger and like over the last six months we've just gotten these like basically bug fixes patches there's yeah. been nothing no new you know and if anything they keep raising the price without actually adding any more value uh, in terms of you know over the year updates right I, I don't know if that's a long-term trend or if just tesla's not doing it anymore but it was one of the cool things of owning a tesla is that you'd wake up and then you'd have like a quicker or a longer range car and now that that's not happening anymore. That's correct. Yep. So that's a bit of a shame. But it's uh, still one of the best crossovers you can buy, I think. And then we've got the Volkswagen Touareg. It's killing it. been driving it to the airport. 134,000 miles on it now. So I'm going to do a two-year 10,000-mile update coming up pretty soon and hopefully bring it to Toby so he can kind of do a once-over, our, our German mechanic, and see what is broken on it. Um, and we just, this weekend, uh, we just did go on a mini drive with the uh, classic mini folks. The yes. Mini. And there was a guy there who had all three generations of the GP, which reminded us that we have a GP sitting in storage that uh, we haven't done anything with. Well, because uh, it's got title issues. So, yeah. Yeah. Basically, the dealer we bought it from skipped title. Yeah. Uh, they, and, yeah. It's a yeah, mess. Which is not cool. So, thank you very much. Uh, and, you know, it means probably driving out to New Mexico and sorting it out. But we're going to do that because it, it's, you know, we, 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 we're not... We're not. We're, make, we're living on YouTube money, so having a car sitting in storage and not getting any airtime is really bad. So look for that vehicle to be back up on the channel uh, probably in the next two weeks, I would say. Yep, for uh, sure. And then upcoming trips. Uh, hopefully, we're going down to Florida uh, to drive the new uh, Defender 90. I'm super stoked about that. Yeah, and the new XF uh, yeah. Jaguar, and I 
think the F pace as well. Yes, exactly. So uh, that's going to be cool. So that, that, that's coming up. And then uh, right now we've got an Infinity sitting in our offices. Yeah, and then Andrea and I are going to go check out the Bronco. So we've got the Bronco Drive coming up very shortly. Yeah, uh, and that's about it. Chicago Auto Show, July 14th. We're still trying to decide whether we're going to go hit that. Uh, I, I want to go because I am you know grew up in Chicago. So to me, that's like going home. Uh, we don't know if there'll be any new vehicles there, unfortunately. That's, the auto shows have not come back yet because of COVID. They're, they're kind of just, and they only, you know, we talked to them today. They're only allowing two people to go down. And I ordered a Jeep. More on that soon when it shows up. Yeah, what'd you order, Tommy? Well, I will tell you later because okay. I have to go take my dog to the vet. All right. So that'll be for next episode. All right, there you go, guys. Thank you for joining us for another episode of uh, TFL Talk. As always, this is Roman. Yeah, and Tommy, check out TFL Car, TFL Truck, TFL Off-Road, TFL Bike, TFL Now, TFL Classics, and TFL Talk for the latest and greatest and in it, new car reviews. And if you're in the TikTok, TFL Studios over at TikTok where we're busily putting up as many cool videos as possible we're trying to build that audience you know, we're almost up to uh, 450,000 Tommy it's good stuff it's good stuff all right see you guys next time ciao